This episode of Epicenter is brought to you by Shapeshift.io, the easiest, fastest, and most secure way to swap your digital assets. Don't run the risk of leaving your funds on a centralized exchange. Visit Shapeshift.io to get started. Hi, welcome to Epicenter, a cryptocurrency podcast that covers upcoming technologies, companies, and networks in the blockchain and cryptocurrency space. I am Meher Roy. And my name is Sunny Agarwal, and today we have with us Grigori Rosso, a professor of computer science at the University of Illinois Urbana-Champaign and the CEO of Runtime Verification. Nice to have you on, on the podcast, Grigori. Can you tell us a little bit about yourself? Thank you for having me. Uh, hi. Um, so yeah, my name is Grigori Rosso, and uh, I, um, I came to the United States in ninety six to do a PhD at the University of California, and then um, um, I was always um, attracted by mathematical techniques and formal methods. And um, uh, I had the privilege to work at NASA for two years uh, before joining the University of Illinois as a computer science professor in 2002. And uh, since then, I've been there um, all the time. And uh, I started a company, Runtime Verification, in order to take ideas that, uh, that um, we initiated at uh, NASA Ames. Actually, that's why we coined the term Runtime Verification at NASA Ames with colleagues there. And, um, and, uh, the plan with the company was to take all these ideas and technologies developed mostly by researchers and academics uh, into real world products that uh, that can make a difference. Um, so that's how we started the company. Awesome. And so that and the sort of the end result of that was the uh, K framework, which is what we are discussing here today. So could you tell us a little bit about uh, what originally got you interested in programming languages and formal systems? So I started off as a mathematician, and um, and uh, when I joined NASA, uh, my 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 job was to 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 prove that programs were correct, that um, that certain um, uh, flight software uh, was uh, safe, and I started asking myself, what does it even mean? What does it mean for a program to be to be correct? Um, so um, so that that what uh, what started me to think about uh, about formal methods about uh, how to how to mathematically capture the meaning of, of programs um, and, and and then I was fascinated by, by by programming languages by all the variety of programming languages and paradigms and in the end realizing that every single one of them had a very deep mathematical meaning and once you capture that meaning, then you have the language in your hands. You can do everything you want with it. You can uh, execute programs. You can prove programs correct. You can do everything. So I, I found that just fascinating. And once I once I once I once I realized that I, I was uh, I was trapped <laughs> into this field, uh, and uh, I just love it. I see. Cool. And so I also read that you know K actually originally started off almost as a teaching tool, as a way to like teach students, and then it ended up uh, evolving out of that. Could you uh, tell us, like, you know, it, does it still have that goal of being a teaching tool, or has it grown much beyond that original vision? Well, first of all, I still use it for teaching. <laughs> um, I used it last semester, and I'll teach it, uh, I'll teach programming language semantics next semester, also using K. So yes, it started uh, from uh, teaching needs. Um, when I joined the department um, of computer science, I was asked to teach programming languages. Actually, I was asked to teach programming languages even during the interview. They really needed somebody to teach programming languages. And, um, and since I already had some ideas how to, how to do that um, uh, formally uh, from NASA, I was very glad to pursue this, uh, this uh, path in my, in my career, uh, namely to teach programming languages and at the same time to develop frameworks for it. Um, and I found actually that, so obviously initially I didn't think about K, I just had to teach programming languages. So, um, so, and I knew that it had to be somehow mathematically rigorous. And, and I looked at the variety of approaches uh, that were available, um, and I tried every single one of them. I think I tried eight or nine different uh, approaches, um, like uh, operational semantics, small step, big step, denotational semantics, evaluation context, reduction semantics with continuations. Um, and, and in the end, came the chemical abstract machine was really interesting. And, and, uh, and in the end, I realized that each of these had a very nice idea under the hood, but at the same time, 
some things were missing from each of the approaches, um, uh, which kind of motivated the other approaches that were invented, right? So people invented different approaches because the previous approaches were missing something. And what I really tried to do with K initially was to just engineer, engineer a framework which takes the best from all the approaches uh, that, that, uh, that we had around and try at the same time to avoid their limitations. Uh, I didn't think at all of the mathematics underlying it. I knew that once it works, uh, <laughs> from a practical point of view, we'll be able to come up with the mathematics because all these other frameworks were based on rigorous mathematics. So the challenge was really how to make it easy, fun, and modular <laughs> to define programming languages. Uh, because uh, one of the big problems when you formalize a language is that you add a new feature to your language and then you have to go back and change everything you've done in order to accommodate changes in the configuration, the program configuration needed for the, for the, for the new feature. And that's very inconvenient and very dem demotivating. Imagine that you have already 200 rules and you add one more feature and you have to go back and change all the 200 rules. Right? You'll feel very demotivated to add new features. And, um, and I was lucky enough that I was um, uh, in the middle of a very nice group of, of students who were very enthusiastic to use the early prototype to define languages. And they used uh, the language and I encouraged them to complain. <laughs> so whenever they had issues, I wanted them to complain. And they came and said, look, I, would, I don't like to duplicate code. I don't like to duplicate rules. I have to write the same rule again and again and again. That's, that's annoying. All right, thank you, thank you. And then we try to engineer it in such a way so that doesn't happen, right? So, so, so that, so that uh, you define the language in a nice incremental constructive way without having to go back and, and change things that you've already defined in order to accommodate uh, new features. So yeah, so we engineered the framework um, and then the mathematics came that put everything together in a nice round uh, thing. So, so of course, like uh, this episode is about the K framework and as I understand it, Professor, the K framework is an attempt to have um, mathematical structures and rules and ways of expressing rules that allow people to write the rules of any programming language. It is essentially a language with which you can write the rules of any programming language. Is, is that right? It's almost like a one ring to rule them all, right? So we, as, as programmers, we use a language to write a program. And like there's like hundreds of languages around the world. And the, the, K, the K framework gives us tools and semantics to express all of these languages in one unified mechanism. Yes, that was the, the goal. And, uh, and uh, that's what it is. And you can think of it either as a meta-programming language in which you define programming languages, or another way to think about it is like a domain-specific language for programming languages. <laughs> um, and in fact, you can even define K in K, uh, which is uh, what we are doing right now, actually. We are re-implementing implementing K in K, right? Because um, K is a language in the end, and uh, it needs to be expressed in itself. And many programming languages actually implement in themselves you know, even Scala and, uh, and other languages. So, um, right, yes, so, so the, challenge, the challenge was how to come up indeed with something very uniform that allows you to define any programming language in any paradigm um, using the same general principles. And uh, what are those general principles so that is possible? Um, and uh, in my classes where I teach programming languages using K, we actually go through various programming paradigms we start with imperative languages, then we move to functional languages, then we go to object-oriented languages and logic programming languages in the end. And students have all the kind of projects along the way where they combine features. So um, yeah, and in the end, in the end, it all boils down to a very simple principle, which is that of a parametric transition, right? Uh, so you have a program configuration, which you can think of as some data structure that holds a snapshot of your program state. And the same happens in all programming languages, no matter what paradigm uh, you use. So you have this program configuration, and then you have rules that match certain structure they care about in that program configuration, in particular the fragment of program that still needs to be executed, for example. So they match whatever part of the configuration they care about, and they apply a transformation. So match and apply. So basically, rewrite rules are pattern rewrites to pattern. 
Um, so you match the left hand pattern and you replace it with the right hand pattern modulo the substitution of the variables that um, that uh, results from the from the matching process. So that's it. That's the only computational mechanism under the hood. And this is Turing complete. It has been shown Turing complete many many years ago by uh, many people in different uh, settings. So it's a very powerful computational mechanism. And what makes it interesting, philosophically speaking, uh, at least from my point of view, is that it allows you to tune the computational granularity of the, compu of the computation, the granularity of the computation. For example, when you define a Turing machine or a lambda uh, calculus, the granularity of the computation is given by the constructs that you use. So with general purpose rewriting, term rewriting, like K employs, you can define that granularity uh, by means of structure. So you define your syntax, and then, um, and then rules match as much of the syntax you want to transform in one step. You do not have to reduce it to lots of smaller steps to perform a big computation. You can just do it with a big matching and transformation. So yes, yeah, so that was the, the, the big challenge. And actually I spent quite a bit of time um, back in 2003, 2004, when, when the whole thing started, thinking about what would be the right mathematical uh, formalism uh, to employ in such a, a, a meta language framework. And I looked at existing approaches um, and uh, writing, term writing really was the most appealing to me exactly because of this capability to, to match as much structure as I want from the program uh, configuration. And then the fact that we were able to define languages across different paradigms quite easily and naturally that was like a bonus, like, a, like an additional um, incentive to, to convince me that is the right way to go. Interesting. So of course, like, so later on in the show, we will get into some of the, uh, some of these details that you're pointing out, which is the idea of the rewriting logic and, uh, and, and how that works. Mm -hmm. But zooming out for a, for a little bit, this seems like a, a language in which you can express any computer language like this seems like a very very interesting idea when 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 you tell it to anyone do you, do you, like how old is that idea and why did people think of this idea in the first place well so the idea is very very old um, lambda calculus itself is based on the same idea lambda calculus actually has only one rule, which is beta reduction. You take a lambda abstraction, apply it to a term, and that transforms it to something else. But it is just one particular writing over one particular syntax. In K, we want to have any rewrite rules over any syntax. And in particular, I can define lambda calculus as a particular theory uh, in, or a particular language in, in K. The same way you can define uh, other, other formalism, other imperative languages based on assignments, based on... Uh, so, so writing is an idea, when it started, I don't know, but it is definitely a very old idea. Um, I think maybe grammars, uh, in the theory of, uh, of, uh, of context-free grammars, we had the first, uh, the first um, um, ideas around writing. Uh, maybe even, even before, even before uh, in early 1900s, uh, <laughs> um, right, even before we had lambda calculus. And um, so many problems, they were not expressed specifically as term writing, but they were instances of the idea of term writing, of the term writing idea. Um, so yeah, so the idea is very old. Um, I would say what is new perhaps is the particular methodology on how to use writing and how to organize your configuration. And what is really important is how to find the place in the configuration where you want to apply a rule. Because rules do not always apply at the top level in your configuration. You have to find the right place where to apply the rules. And this is where you may need to, to specify contexts. Uh, contexts are actually critical for, uh, for efficient implementations and effective implementations of, of rewriting. Um, so yeah, I would say that writing itself is not a new idea. Um, and even contexts, they are not very new. Um, and the K framework itself was engineered from many ideas that were floating already in the programming language uh, semantics uh, field. Uh, but I think what K really did well um, 
of course I'm biased, <laughs> but I believe that what he did well was to put all these ideas together in a in a in a meaningful and practically uh, useful way, um, without without worrying about the theory initially. And then when we came up with the theory, I was very pleased to see that things fit so nicely mathematically as well. So uh, we developed a logic, uh, a foundational logic underlying the entire K-Framework, which uh, now explains everything we do. So everything we do with the K-Framework can be explained as a search for a proof, uh, for a fact, right? So everything we do in the end is very rigorously uh, backed by a mathematical proof, um, starting with execution, verification, uh, model checking, symbolic execution, everything is backed by a proof. I think that's where some of the innovations um, uh, on the mathematical side the K framework happened. Mm -hmm. So, uh, c could you like maybe for some of our listeners who are uh, less familiar with like programming languages, uh, you know, could you explain to us a little bit about what the difference between like this uh, syntax and semantics are, and how you can use rewrite rules to, um, you know, it, syntax is usually about like uh, explaining what the vocabulary is, while semantics is more about the, what the grammar is, and it seems very easy to understand how you would use like rewrite rules to explain syntax, but how would you use these to explain semantics? Uh, and can you like talk a little bit about this? Uh, in fact, in fact, I teach programming languages to, um, um, to fresh students, um, and I teach programming languages using K uh, and syntax and semantics as defined in K, and they grasp it right away, even if they do not have a lot of experience, or even if they only know one or two programming languages, they grasp the idea, because it's so simple. Um, so in terms of syntax, yeah, so the difference between syntax and semantics. So syntax is about really taking a string, right? A program, what is a program? A program is just a string of characters, uh, right? You can think of it that way, some, you know, level of abstraction. And then you have to give that a meaning. But before you are even able to give that a meaning, you have to realize that there are some constructs there, right? There is an if then else construct. There is a while construct. There is a function defined. Right, so how do you go from a flat sequence of characters to uh, an, a, a tree, an abstract syntax, what we call an abstract syntax tree, um, basically a term that corresponds to the program? How do you get from the syntax, from, from the strings to the program? Right, so that's what the parsing uh, does. And there are, so parsing is not new. Parsing is a very old field. There are lots of uh, algorithms, uh, some of them more efficient, others more general. And, um, and in K, we employ both efficient and general algorithms. You can define actually your own parser outside of the K framework. The K framework also gives you a general, powerful um, uh, algorithm, which is not very efficient, but very general. Uh, and, and yeah, so basically the, the syntax allows you, and, and K has this keyword, syntax, right? We define syntactic productions. For example, we say that an expression is an expression, the symbol plus another expression, right? And an expression can also be an integer. For example, right? And now if you have one plus two, the parser that is generated automatically from these uh, syntactic definitions, the parser will will uh, will uh, give you a tree, a nice after syntax tree, where you have one plus at the top and then two to the right. So now you finally or you have some structure, right? So once you have some structure from from your original program, now you can talk about semantics. So what is the semantics? The semantics takes this structures, these trees, these abstract syntactic trees, and gives them a meaning. And now depending on which mathematical formalism we employ, this meaning can be expressed in one way or another, but in all approaches in the end, what you get is some sort of mathematical object that corresponds to that syntax that you started uh, with. And in our case, in the case of K, the way we add this meaning to syntax is by means of rewrite rules. Um, where we transform iteratively this tree into a value, right? So suppose that your program was one plus two, right? So the parser will give you one plus two, a nice tree with plus at the top and one and two to the left and the right. And then there is a rewrite rule saying that if you have an integer plus another integer, this rewrites to the sum of the two uh, integers in the, in the mathematical domain, right? So with one rule, you transform that three that had three nodes, one plus and, and, and two, you transform it into just one uh, uh, node three, which has the value three. 
All right, so, so the semantics is obtained by iterative transformations of the original program. You start with the original program, you put it in some, mathem some configuration, which contains all the additional information in order to run the program, which could be like a, like a state, uh, stacks, and all kinds of additional infrastructure that you need in order for the program to make sense. And then step by step, applying rules one by one, you transform that into a final configuration, which contains the result. Of the program that you're looking for. So uh, perhaps I, I'd like to restate uh, restate this in in my own way, right? So uh, we can think of let's say we can think of human languages first, right? So in any language, so for our listeners, any of you that has learned a new language, you would have learned like vocabulary, and then you would have learned grammar. So Vocab, what is vocabulary? Vocabulary is like, oh, I, uh, let's say I, I'm, I'm, I'm out to learn German. And uh, vocabulary is like, so, so there is a spoon and then there's a word in German. So let's say like there's a, uh, there's a fork and there's gabel. So gabel means fork in German. So it's like vocabulary is the association of a word, which is like gabel to this thing which is like a fork but then there is also grammar which is like once you have a lot of words how can these words be arranged together right so in some senses um, what i feel professor is like that semantics is the computer science equivalent of vocabulary and syntax is the computer science equivalent of grammar right so for example like if if I want to tell the computer that it has to uh, it has to compare two things, and if they are equal, do something. So this is like an operation, and semantics is like what word does the programmer use to represent this operation, and syntax is what the way in which these operations can connect together in order to make a well-formed program. Is is that right? It's almost, um, there is a bit more going on in a computer program, right? Because in natural language, you just say something as a sentence and, uh, and your sentence doesn't have to compute <laughs> into a result. Right? Your sentence is being parsed using the grammatical rules. Uh, and then based on the individual meanings of the individual words, right, in the vocabulary, you then build the meaning for the entire, for the entire sentence, right, without having to execute um, Right, the the uh, the sentence. So, in some sense, if you think about K, okay, what we do, we take such a sentence, which would be the program, and um, and then we transform it step by step into another sentence, which is a bit closer to the final result, and then into another sentence, into another sentence, until in the end becomes three. You know, the final the final um, result. All right. For example, here is a sentence. Let x be three in the expression. 1 plus x. All right, so what is the meaning of this sentence? <laughs> um, right, uh, you may think it is 4, right, because you say let x, equal x be 1 in 1 plus x, but uh, it is not immediately obvious unless you do some computation going, uh, there. So you can parse it and you realize, okay, I have the keyword let, which is like a statement. Then I say, oh, the variable x, which is equal to 1, so I can use all the grammatic rules and I can parse this sentence into something that now I can add semantics to. And how we add semantics to in this particular language would be that I just replace x, I transform the sentence let x equals 1 in, no, let x equals 3 in 1 plus x, I transform it into 1 plus 3. How? I just realize that I have a let construct and let x equals 1 in some expression means that I should go ahead and substitute uh, 1 for x in that sentence or 3 for x in that sentence uh, in the remaining of the sentence which is uh, 1 plus x now becomes 1 plus 3 and then I apply another rule um, which says oh 1 plus 3 this goes to 4 right so I go in one more step so it's like it's like keep talking keeping talking <laughs> right so if you have an original sentence which you parse and that gives you uh, the program, but then you can keep talking about how that program computes, right? And then you come up with the result in the end. 
And I would say that the syntax of K is the part which allows you to parse that sentence so you can start transforming it. And then the rules are the keep talking part, right, which allows you to eventually get the result for the whole program. Okay, for example, if you have a Java program, you have a for loop or a while loop, right? So that computes, you may execute it like a, like a thousand times. You may do a very complicated computation there. How do you know what's the result, right? You have to simply go through the loop, step by step by step by step, like working through the program. And, uh, and that's what the rules of K allows you, allow, allow you to do. Okay. Right? So sometimes I, I know that the word rule may be confusing because you have rules for the grammar and rules for the computation. <laughs> Uh, the rules for the grammar allow you to parse, and the rules for the computation allow you to compute. Okay, so we can, I kind of understand this now. Um, what is the re, what are the benefits of like formally, uh, like of these formal semantics? Because like we have like you know hundreds of like common programming languages already out there, and most of them usually aren't formally spe uh, specified. They're usually like you know. Oftentimes, sometimes they have reference implementations, or sometimes they have like guidebooks, but they don't really have like they don't. Oftentimes, you find like undefined behavior and whatnot. Uh, what are some of the benefits of having this like formal specification of every language? That's a, that's actually a very good question, uh, which uh, students often ask uh, when they take the the class uh, programming language and we start talking about formal semantics. So here's my short answer. Okay? So what is Java? Okay, if I ask you what is Java? Whatever Oracle tells me it is. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, but if I want to, if I want to, to so, so let, let, let's, maybe Java is it's clearer, but let's, let's consider C because you mentioned undefined behavior. Okay, C is full of undefined behavior. So what is C? Right, there is an 800 page standard, which is an ISO standard, right? 800 pages of text describing what C is. More than half of those pages is about defining undefined behavior, right? What does it mean for a C program not to be a correct program, right? Some, of, some things are obvious, like division by zero, yes. Or access array, uh, on, you know, out of bounds of an array. You have an array, right? The numbers from one to elements from one to or zero to 99. And now you access element 101. Is that correct or not? Uh, so C will not check that for you. You can access it and get some number or crash or whatever. So, so here is the question. Now, so what is C? And, and why do you care about what is C? Suppose that you have a pacemaker, right? The pacemaker will run a C program. Okay, how do you know that that C program does what it's supposed to do? Because otherwise you die, right? So what if that C program does an array out of bounds access or a division by zero, and then you have a problem, right? You die. So what you'd like ideally is to have a way to say that that program does something. And this is where formal semantics comes to the picture. Without a formal semantics, you do not know what the language is. You need a definition in mathematics, right? We always need definitions in order to prove facts, in order to define concepts, right? Otherwise, we cannot reason about those concepts. So if you want to reason about programs, if you want to say anything about a program, except, you know, um, waving hands, right? if you want to say anything about a program, you need a rigorous way to say what the programming language is or what the program is. And this is where the formal semantics comes into the picture. It's basically that link that is needed in order to do reasoning about programs. This episode is brought to you by Shapeshift, the world's leading trustless digital asset exchange. Quickly swap between dozens of leading cryptocurrencies, including Bitcoin, Ether, Zcash, Gnosis, Monero, Golem, Augur, and so many more. When you go to shapeshift.io, you simply select your currency pair, give them your receiving address, send the coins, and boom. Shapeshift is not your traditional cryptocurrency exchange. You don't need to create an account. You don't need to give them your personal information and they don't hold your coins. So you are never at risk from a hacker or other malicious actor. Shapeshift has competitive rates and is even integrated in some of your favorite wallet apps like Jax. So you can swap your digital assets directly within your wallet just as easily as putting on your slippers. Whenever you see that good looking fox, you know that's where Shapeshift is. So to get started, visit shapeshift.io and start trading. And we'd like to thank Shapeshift for their support of Epicenter. So one of the reasons that, like, you know, for example, in C, oftentimes things are left undefined 
is because like it allows for the some freedom to for the compiler to do optimizations and then you know oftentimes you can use like things like linters and stuff that throw warnings at you saying like hey by the way what you're doing is unsafe but you know we'll let it happen because the compiler might want need it for some reason so what are some of the trade-offs that you do there by like you know restricting the freedom of the co compilers so yes, yes, that's why C has the undefined behavior because they want to allow compilers the freedom to do whatever they want, basically, uh, more or less with undefined programs and to optimize. Uh, so C, one of the main applications of C is, uh, um, uh, is in embedded systems where performance is critical. Um, and um, and uh, to achieve performance, you need to take advantage of the hardware to the last drop of, of, of speed. And compiler developers really love that, how to translate C programs into something that is really very efficient on, on, on the target hardware. So, so, so for example, let's take, let's take actually uh, array out of bounds access, right? So if you want to be absolutely safe, you would have to check that you do not access the array out of bounds. But then you have to pay the price, the cost of that checking. Right, you have to read the value, evaluate uh, the argument, and see that it is between bounds. Right, so that costs more than it costs to actually access the array, and that's unacceptable for uh, for these people. So what they assume in C is that the programmer knows what she's doing, and um, and uh, and because of that, we can assume that the program is well defined, and then compilers take advantage of that and try to make the program as fast as possible. That is great. It's part of the spirit of C, the so-called spirit of C. That's what you want in C. However, if your C program now runs in a car or in a medical device that your life depends upon, or in some spacecraft or aircraft, then you cannot afford to have unexpected behaviors of the program. And those unexpected behaviors happen all the time in C when you change the hardware. You have a C program that looks reasonable to you. You run it on a particular desktop, you test it, looks great. But then you put it on a different device, on a different platform, and it gives you a completely different result. And you may die, literally, because of that. Right? If you, so you cannot afford that. If you cannot afford that, and there are many, many embedded system applications where correctness became paramount in C programs, and that's where the form of semantics comes into the picture. Because now what I can do, I can take that program and I can analyze it with the formal semantics of C, which defines completely all the undefined behavior in the standard. And now that tool, this formal semantic framework, the K framework actually run with the C uh, semantics as input, will tell you whether your program is undefined or not. And if it is undefined, you know. You can still ignore it if you want to. You can still compile it with your favorite compiler, knowing that it has some errors. But at least the framework tells you that, hey, you have an undefined program here, be careful. If you are not careful, it's, it's, your, it's, your, it's your risk you are taking. And there are some tools, like the lint tools that you mentioned, which check for some very simple um, uh, lint style, so-called lint style uh, errors, but far from all the undefined behaviors. Some undefined behaviors are very tricky in, uh, in C. So, so basically what will happen is like, you know, I have a C program and I'm doing some sort of weird undefined behavior, let's say uh, doing two right on the same line or something, right? What, 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 uh, what uh, K would do is basically like throw me an error saying, hey, by the way, this behavior is undefined. It doesn't actually make like a choice on what to do. It actually, instead of like, you know, a compiler would usually do what, like pick whatever it wants to do you instead will throw an error saying this is not allowed at all. Yes, yes, Okay. definitely, yes. And, and then if you, you can go further and actually prove the program correct, you can prove okay. that the program does what it's supposed to do, in which case you go through all possible behaviors, no matter what the input to the program is, and you, you show exhaustively by what we call exhaustive runtime verification, go symbolically on all the paths that can happen in your program, and you prove that there is no undefined behavior no matter how this program executes. And this, this particular feature became extremely useful to companies like NASA, Boeing. We have several contracts with, with this. We use the Cray framework with the C semantics for exactly this purpose. So 
could you uh, expand a little bit on this then? Like, what is exactly is the relationship between like formal verification and formal semantics? Because oftentimes, like people think that formal verification is like strictly in the realm of functional <laughs> programming languages. People are like, oh, if you want to do formal verification, you need to use Haskell or OCaml. But now, if you're saying that we have this way, K provides us like a way we can do formal verification of C programming and stuff. Um, could you expand a little bit more about this? So. Uh, um... I love functional programming myself, right? Uh, and I often found that the functional programming community uh, is a bit too enthusiastic about functional programming in terms of verification, um, in the sense that they try to encourage people to use, formal ver to use uh, functional languages because um, the promise being that it's easier to verify your programs. Um, I think it is easier to understand the programs, the functional programs. Uh, it is easier to, to reason about them in your mind. But in terms of uh, actual formal verification, things are uh, also difficult um, uh, to, to verify with functional uh, programming languages, especially because many functional programming languages are not as pure as, um, as uh, the original lambda calculus uh, was. Once you have side effects, once you have a heap, uh, once you have references, uh, things um, can, can be quite, quite hairy. What we did in K actually was to step back a bit and look at what is the actual foundation underlying all programming languages, not only functional programming languages, right? And this is the writing, the term writing um, uh, capability. Functional languages also do the writing. Um, um, Imperative languages also do the writing, um, and, uh, and um, object-oriented languages also do the writing, and in even uh, logic programming languages do the writing. So there is this basic foundation that goes um, uh, beyond all the particular paradigms, including functional uh, languages. And um, yeah, so, so um, I, I wouldn't say that it is necessarily easier to verify uh, functional uh, uh, programming languages. I would say that a lot of the functional of the uh, of the program verification work so far was done by means of what we call whole logic or axiomatic semantics, where you have to essentially redefine your programming language as a logic. I know this may sound a bit <laughs> heavy if you don't come from the field, uh, but you literally define a whole logic corresponding to Java. Right, where you have proof rules, you have uh, theorems that you prove, and all these effects about, about programs. And, um, and uh, those core logics or axiomatic semantics tend to be a lot more involved for, for object-oriented languages or for, uh, or for uh, uh, imperative languages than for functional languages. So if you follow the traditional formal verification um, approach, then yes, it may be easier to define an axiomatic semantic than uh, for a functional language than for an imperative language that you can then use for formal verification. But what we deliberately decided in K uh, was to not have to define another logic for a programming language in order to verify programs. So we want to have only one formal semantics of the programming language and to derive program verifiers from that semantics automatically, essentially. It, it is in some sense like, like defining a whole logic automatically or deriving a whole logic automatically for your, uh, for your language from the formal semantics of the, of the programming language. This is not a traditional approach to program verification. This is very important to, uh, to clarify, and I'm glad that you asked this question because I think this is one of the critical insights of, uh, of K. Right? So we take an operational semantics, an inherently executable semantics that gives you a reference model of your programming language that you can use to run programs, run tests, same like compilers do or interpreters. But at the same time, it gives you from the exact for same formal semantics, it gives you a program verifier that you can use to verify programs. And that is sound and what we call relatively complete. So it's sound and complete. So any property about any programming language can be proved with, um, with this uh, language independent uh, framework um, and logic underlying it. So that was one of the biggest theoretical achievements uh, behind, the, behind the K framework, this foundation, which allows you to detach yourself from having to define um, um, you know, a whole, an axiomatic semantics for your programming language only for verification, uh, program verification reasons. 
you get the formal verif the formal program verifier for your language exactly the same way you get the execution engine or the parser <laughs> completely automatically from the formal semantics of the programming language okay so the, you know the tagline of k is that it's this rewrite based executable semantic framework so we've talked about the rewrite base we've talked about semantic and framework let's talk about this executable part what does it mean for this framework to be executable and how uh, is that a, in like our other frameworks in the past been executable like what, what does this exactly mean right so executable means that you can take a program <laughs> throw it to the framework um, uh, so, so you have the framework and take a programming language semantics first, right? And you instantiate the framework with the semantics and now you pass a program and the framework will execute the program the same way an implementation of your language would do, right? So if you take a C, let's say uh, you take a C program, right? And you compile it with GCC and run it, right? So actually our tool uh, that, you, that, that incorporates the C semantics in the K framework um, is... Um, is framed as a replacement of GCC, as a drop-in replacement of GCC, which we call KCC, right? So we, so we, with our framework, you just say KCC, your program dot C, and it gives you a binary and you run it. That's what, that's what I mean by executable. <laughs> it is as executable as an implementation of your programming language. And, and <laughs> that's funny because uh, that's how I educate my students, right? That's what the formal semantics is. And, and then they, they have this phase but why, why would it be any other way? Uh, isn't that what a formal semantics should be? You should be able to execute the program. And then I have to refer them to axiomatic semantics or for logic, where you define these logics for pre post conditions um, and uh, invariants and so on, where you can prove programs correct, but you cannot execute them. If I have a loop that executes 100 iterations, I cannot just run the loop with the whole logic. I can prove the loop correct if somebody is giving me an invariant, but I cannot run it. Um, and, uh, and that's very inconvenient because imagine this, imagine that you have a formal, um, you know, uh, logic, uh, a formal semantics in using axiomatic semantics or for logic for a programming language that you cannot execute. How do you know it, if it is correct or not? In the case of C, the C semantics has, I think, almost 5,000 semantic rules now, 5,000 rules in the semantics, okay, that, uh, that people had to sit down and run and test. Test is a keyword. How do you test them? How do you know that those are right? Because like anything big, a semantics can be wrong. When you add thousands of rules, something may go wrong somewhere, right? How do you test it? It is, it is extremely valuable to actually be able to take programs that compiler developers or, uh, or, or interpreter developers use to test their implementations and to use exactly the same programs to test your semantics. And then to use exactly the semantics for program verification, right? As opposed to catching errors only by proving wrong programs correct or not being able to prove some programs that look correct, correct, right? Which is how you catch errors in, uh, in, in uh, conventional program verifiers. So how does the, um, how do you verify the uh, binary, like the, whatever K is running, like is it, a, is it compiled or interpreted? But like, how do you, is, is do we uh, write like the, uh, x86 architecture assembly in K and that's how K knows how to compile to that or like how, what how do we verify the actual execution of the K uh, language very good question so there are different ways to do it um, so as a matter of fact we do have a semantics of x86 uh, that is uh, in the process of finalizing uh, um, which means that you can then use GCC compiler program to x86 and then run the x86 with the K framework but that's not what we do uh, with the KCC tool. Um, the alternative is to actually have a formal semantics of C itself without any translation to anything else. And then you run the C programs directly with that semantics as that granularity, the granularity, the intended granularity of the C language without any translation to another language. Because typically when you translate from one language to another, you lose something in the translation. Or otherwise, you have to prove that you lose nothing and that's extremely difficult. As a matter of fact, we, we found several uh, program verifiers for C that lose undefined behaviors uh, in the translation because they translate from C to some intermediate language that their prover knows. And as part of the translation, they, they lose behaviors. For example, they may reorder the arguments of a function or they may reorder the arguments of an operation, of a primitive operation, um, you know, as they translate. 
and all those um, uh, may, may eliminate undefined behaviors. So yeah, so K doesn't have an actual binary at all. K doesn't have an intermediate language at all. So K works directly with the syntax of your programming language. That's why you define a syntax and then a semantics. And your syntax gives you the actual structure on which you want to define your computation granularity. And then the rules add that computation granularity to your desired syntax. Now, if you want to implement a translator from that to another language, you can implement that in K as well, also using rules. As a matter of fact, we have done that uh, for, um, for a language called Plutus, developed by IOHK, uh, and we implemented a translator from that language to Yele, where e Yele is a low-level language that, um, that runs uh, in a virtual machine. Probably we'll talk about <laughs> that shortly. Um, uh, so, so yeah, so that translator itself is implemented in K. Right? So K, in K, you can implement translators, but also direct semantics uh, of languages. And again, K does not have like its own binary uh, uh, language. It's, it's not like x86 or LLVM. It's not like that. It's, it's not something that you translate your language into. It's something in which you define your language exactly the way your language is without any translation. So the future essentially with, with K is uh, you define, like let's say, let's say we're talking about any language like JavaScript. So the semantics of JavaScript are expressed in K. And of course, like once you express uh, the semantics of JavaScript uh, in K, you will get all of the tool sets that are required to actually execute J JavaScript along with it. So in this case, you'll get the interpreter. You will get some kind of formal verification tool sets out of K. And whoever is the person that is sort of updating the JavaScript language can just update the semantics of JavaScript in K and, and not touch the tools at all. The tools will be changed automatically and correct by construction. Which, again, I want to reiterate that this is not how things are done um, in most other um, approaches. In most other approaches, you develop a model checker for JavaScript, or you develop a program verifier for JavaScript, or you develop a symbolic execution engine for JavaScript. We do not want that because we believe that is a huge amount of effort and a waste of talent, literally. There are many PhD students at top universities who do just that for their PhD. They define a symbolic execution engine for JavaScript or a deductive program verifier for JavaScript. And, 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 and so, so that, that has lots of disadvantages, um, um, uh, not only duplication of work, <laughs> because each tool for JavaScript or for Java or for C, let's take model, say model checkers, implement the same algorithm over and over and over again, just for a slightly different language or for slightly different infrastructure, uh, configuration, uh, syntax, and so on. So we believe firmly that this tool should be implemented once and for all. If I implement a model checker, I want to implement a model checker once and for all, and then to take the programming language as input and never touch the model checker. Right, so is that if you have, if you think like if you have N programming languages, and K or M, let's say not K, K is taken. So N programming languages and M, uh, let's say tools that you may be interested in, like, uh, uh, like an interpreter, a compiler, a symbolic execution engine, a model checker, symbolic model checker, deductive program verifier, right? So N languages and M tools. You have N times M combinations, right? And, and people implemented such combinations for different languages with different tools. Right? And they publish papers. It's easy to publish papers. Trust me, I learned that. <laughs> it's very easy. It's a lot easier to publish a paper than to develop something that lasts. Um, and that's so why we wanted to have a complete disconnection between languages and tools. We want the tools to be implemented once and for all, as efficiently as possible. And by the way, everything we do is open source and we encourage the community to contribute. Right? So then everybody can contribute to the model checker, let's say, to make it faster and faster and faster and better and better and better. And then completely separated, we define language semantics that are passed as input to all these tools, right? And I can use exactly the same model checker tool with Java or with JavaScript or with EVM, the Ethereum virtual machine, or with Yele or with any other language. It literally should not matter at all. And if it matters, then something needs to be fixed <laughs> uh, because things should be done completely language independently.
And that's the philosophy of the K-Framework. And the tool implementation is done in this spirit, and the foundation, the logics, the mathematics, everything is done in this, in this spirit. It's a matter of engineering now to just make it work <laughs> uh, all the way through. And there is a lot of interest now from the blockchain uh, community, which is great because um, together we can make it happen. <laughs> so give us a sense of why the blockchain community is interested in K and why there's starting to be some traction for this tool in the blockchain space. I think the, the blockchain faces challenges that were not there before. Um, like imagine, imagine that you have a C program in your car running in one of the electronic control units in your car, right? Even if that has a bug, um, nobody knows the code and nobody knows how to attack it, right? But on the blockchain, everybody sees the code. And if the code can be exploited, if there is a bug that can be attacked, somebody will somewhere. So there is a huge, huge incentive on all uh, sides now to, to get these programs right, correct, secure. And what does it mean for a program to be secure or correct? What does it mean for a string to be a program? <laughs> you see, we get back to the same questions. Uh, you need a formal semantics of the programming language. Once you have a formal semantics, you can say what the program is. Once you know what the, once you know what the program is, you can start reasoning about the program and you can prove properties about it. And then I can give you an actual mathematical proof that this program is secure. Right? You can still try to attack it, <laughs> but the likelihood to attack a program that has been proved secure uh, is, is, is much, much lower than, uh, than, uh, than a program that has been just um, written and hoped <laughs> to, be, to be secure. It doesn't mean the programs, all verified programs are correct. Sometimes they may have issues because the specifications may be wrong, the programming languages may have flaws. Um, but uh, actually, we have verified many smart contracts uh, as part of, um, um, probably you saw it on our webpage, uh, runtimeverification.com. We have a smart contract um, um, a service that we offer, some smart contract verification service, and we do verify smart contracts, and we verify lots of smart contracts. And there is not a single smart contract that we verified, which was flawless. <laughs> right? So we found little <laughs> issues in every single one of them. Um, and, and that's because simply because when we execute it with the formal semantics, there is no behavior um, missed. You see everything uh, in the formal semantics of the language, provided that you have a correct formal semantics of the language. That's, that's another question. Is this the right semantics of the language? And uh, some languages are just too complex. So, um, you know, sometimes you may wonder if you capture the right, the right mathematical model of the language because the language is too complex. Sometimes not even the inventors of the language know exactly what they meant, you know, with certain constructs. <laughs> so essentially, the, the future that the K framework enables is, um, so today when I, let's say when I write a smart contract, uh, what, I, what I want out of my smart contract is a high degree of assurance that the program will behave a certain way in all conditions, right? Yes. So I want that, that form of assurance, right? I, I want that form of assurance that that smart contract will is always going to give that money to my descendants and nobody else, right? Now, now there is like lots of places where things can go wrong in getting that form of assurance. The first is, the first is of course like human error, right? So, so there's some developer that is developing the contract and they can make an error in its implementation. But then of course this, the second kind of error could be that let's say the developer is developing using Solidity and the Solidity has versions, right? <laughs> there's 0.4.2 and there's 0.4.3 and, and stuff. So the developer developed using, using 0.4.2 but actually, when we compiled it down to bytecode, somebody ended up using the next version. Yes. 0.4.3. And that caused a bug of some kind. Or so simply the compiler has a bug in itself. <laughs> that's the third kind. You may think that the program does what you think that it does according to the Solidity code. But when it gets down to the EVM, it will be something completely different. 
you know, because right. EVM has all kind of restrictions, uh, like the stack. The stack has a finite, uh, a bounded size, and that size is not visible in your Solidity program. So you may think that everything is all right, but actually it's not. Or you may have an overflow, or the compiler may change the order in which the arithmetic is being done, and an overflow that was not there before occurs in the binary that is generated. <laughs> so all sorts of, of errors that can happen. So I think having a formal semantics will not prevent you from making the human errors. Right? If you type in a wrong account number or you know, where you transfer your money, okay, that's a human error. Right? But it will at least avoid the stupid errors. There are errors that should not happen, unexpected errors that are out of your control as a, as a, as a human. Right? So those should not happen. Right? I should not have a comp compilation error. You know? I should not have an error due to an overflow because uh, you know some shortcuts were taken somewhere in the implementation of the language or in the design of the whole language and a shortcut could be not having a semantics at all right so some people you know just think let's not waste time doing a semantics and then the it is not clear what the what what the language is supposed to do and you may have two different teams implementing the language differently because they like that happens a lot with C Right? There are lots of C programs that you compile them with GCC, you get one result. You compile it with Clang, you get another result. If you compile them with uh, Intel, CC, the Intel compiler, you get another result. <laughs> That's ridiculous, right? If you think about it. Imagine that. Imagine the same thing happening with your smart contract, right? You write a smart contract and you have three different behaviors depending on <laughs> which, uh, you know, which uh, compilers were used. So is this how, like, um, you... So do you use like the equivalency checker to like verify the compiler essentially where like you can like you can you can check you have solidity com uh, defined in K and then you have the EVM bytecode defined in K and is the idea that you can use you can like check to make sure that the solidity code is equivalent to the out compiled EVM bytecode? So guys before I answer this let me tell you that I'm very impressed with your knowledge. <laughs> your questions are so deep and nice. Um, so it's a, it's a pleasure literally a pleasure uh, talking to you. Um, so, all right, so two approaches here. One is to do the equivalence checking that you mentioned, right? So you have a, you have a let's say a language solidity and you have a target a low level language, let's say the Ethereum virtual machine, the EVM, right? So you can have a semantics of solidity, you have a semantics of the EVM. As a matter of fact, we do have a semantics of the EVM and we are in the process of completing a semantics of solidity. Once you have the two formal semantics, now you can take a program, translate it, and you can prove that that program, the original program is equivalent the source to the target program based on the semantics, the mathematical semantics of the two languages. So first of all, notice that this question itself, what does it mean for the original Solidity program to be equivalent to the EVM program? This question cannot even be posed, it cannot, doesn't even make sense without formal semantics of the two languages. Right? What does it mean for something to be a program? What does it mean to be equivalent to another program? <laughs> it's the, the mathematical definitions of the languages. Right, so this is approach number one, right, where you can Take the two semantics of the two languages, a program, and you can prove the program equivalent, uh, the original program equivalent to the target program. And this is called translation validation, actually, in uh, informal methods. Another approach, which is the one we are employing right now, actually, uh, in our uh, smart contract verification business, um, runtiverification.com, is to take the compiler completely out of the picture. Right, so I don't care, we don't care literally what you meant in your Solidity code. Uh, we verify the binary that is generated, the EVM binary. I don't even care what compiler you use, what compiler version you use, nothing. We just take the final binary. And the trick here is to come up with the right specifications, right? Because whenever you verify a program, you verify it against some formal specification. So what we do, we actually talk to developers. We sit down with developers. Actually, right now we have two developers from uh, DAC Hub here. Um, so it's always great to... Uh, work with uh, people who actually develop <laughs> this code, right? So we meet with developers and we talk to them and we sit down hours, days, until we agree on what they meant in order to come up with the right formal specifications. We have helped them come up with the formal specifications if needed. And then once we have the formal specifications, we verify the generated binary against those formal specifications, right? And if we find any discrepancy, any behavior that was not captured by the formal specifications, we immediately report it to them. And then we map those bugs back to the original Solidity code, because in the end, we have to give them um, uh, error messages related to the Solidity code. And as I said, we, in everything that we verified so far, we found 
some flaws uh, in one way or another. Most of them related to overflows or uh, or missing uh, or implicit assumptions. That's another thing. Uh, people thought that the program does something, but it does that thing only under additional assumptions that uh, they didn't really capture in any way. Uh, and then they made with additional checks in the program to make sure that those things would indeed hold those assumptions. So yes, so you can verify compilers, you can validate compilers, you can do translation validation, or you can verify directly the generated uh, binary, which is what we do right now. And we can afford to do that because smart contracts are still relatively small. Right? It, it would be very hard to do that with the flight software at NASA or Boeing, right? Because those have already millions of lines of C, and then when you compile them to binary, they, they are huge, and it's very hard to reason about those. But for smart contracts, it's relatively doable to verify directly the, the binary. It's the safest way to go anyway. So I wouldn't be able to, for example, like, you know, let's say we have two major Ethereum imp client implementations, Geth and Parity, and we just saw like this week there was a bug in Parity that would have caused it to like fork from Geth, right? Yeah. But the issue is that these code, that you know, it, these client code bases are much, much larger than smart contract. So it wouldn't be possible Right for now, at least, to use like equivalency checkers to check to make sure client implementations are the same. It it should be possible. It should be possible. Of course, it's a matter of uh, effort and uh, resources. Uh, so sometimes, so right now, um, for example, we are verifying the Casper uh, implementation for the Ethereum Foundation. Uh, we have a security grant uh, with them, and the program is uh, only several hundred lines of uh, Viper, um, and it still takes almost two days to run all the proofs uh, for all the properties that we want to verify, right? So let's say a thousand lines of code and it takes two days, right, to verify completely. Uh, but it's all completely automatic. Uh, once we write the properties, it's all completely automatic. So you can imagine if you have um, a program that is a hundred thousand lines um, in, in a language like C or Java, that will take a lot of time unless, unless you know, you help it. Um, you can provide lemmas, you can, um, you know, give hints um, and, 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 and help it. But then it's less automatic and it's, um, it's more work um, for users. So I would say, in a, first of all, I think all smart contracts <laughs> should be verifiable, uh, should be verified actually these days. It's almost, I would say it's almost insane that, um, that uh, you know, people bet their money on smart contracts that are not verified <laughs> because you know if any flaw is there then then um, then you know things can can go completely wrong um, and it's not that hard to verify the smart contracts yes it's harder to verify larger programs particularly you know consensus algorithms and so on those are very very hard to get right and to verify it's very hard to even specify what it, what does it what it means for them to be secure and correct but the smart contracts themselves, they, they are very low-hanging fruit. We can do it right now, and we should do it as a community. So last week on, uh, on Epicenter, we had uh, Zilliqa come on and talk about their Scylla language. And their Scylla language that they're building is, like, they're designing it to be very... Uh, they're designing it for compilation to cock at some point. And for now, they're doing all of the translation to cock by hand. Uh, and they, in the end, they want to get it compiled to cock. Is the idea with K is that instead of all of these different smart contracting languages compiling, to, figuring out how to compile to cock, they just have to specify in K, and the idea is that K will then be able to compile to cock at some point. And is that possible already? Is there already a cock backend? We have a cock backend, and uh, more in, more interesting, actually, you can take the the cock proofs and translate them into proofs in the logic underlying K matching logic. So in some sense, you can take proofs in cock into proofs in K, actually. Mm -hmm. uh, and that is not surprising because it is always the case that you can go between different uh, um, semantic frameworks. Um, uh, once, once you have something defined rigorously mathematically, then you can translate from another rigorously mathematically defined uh, thing to it uh, and back and forth. So that doesn't mean that one is more powerful than the other. Uh, in the end, they are all powerful. Um, but I would say the difference is that we do not translate things to K. All right? So we do not take a language and translate it to K in order to reason about it. We actually construct the language, define the language in K without a translation. 
Right? As we discussed, we define the syntax and that gives you the granularity and then you add the rules that work directly over the syntax of your language. So you can basically step by step, you can, actually we do have a step command, right? You can push step, 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 and you execute the program exactly in its original syntax uh, using the case, the, the case semantic rules. And, and, and our logic, the uh, logic underlying K allows you to prove properties about the programs directly at the K level without translating to any other um, uh, formalism. Yes, I understand it's very tempting to take a language and translate it to Coq, but then you have to start worrying about your translation itself. Why is my translation correct? What people do also very frequently is to define languages in Coq directly. The same way we define them in K, they define them in Coq. Right? And sometimes those uh, semantics are executable, so they can get an interpreter out of them as well, and then they can also do reasoning using uh, Coq. So when they do that, the two approaches are very similar. But keep in mind that in K we have a lot other tools, not only um, a, a prover. Right? So Coq is an interactive prover. So you have to interact with it and prove things. Uh, with K we can also do symbolic execution, we can do symbolic model checking, bounded model checking. There are lots of tools specialized for languages. Coq is not really specialized for programming languages. Coq is a, is a proof assistant for any proofs in any mathematical theory. It's a lot more general and there is a price to pay for that. I guess like I'd like to get a sense of what the future looks like when a lot of smart contract language developers adopt the KA framework to define their languages. So I think, of course, like one of the differences is pretty obvious. So today, Solidity is, is developed by Christian Reith Wiesner and his team. And, and in the future, the way their workflow changes is uh, they, they define Solidity, the semantics of Solidity in K. And whenever they want to issue an update, they just issue an update to the semantics in K and that's it. K will take care of uh, making a compiler for it interpreter, uh, yes. Yes. all of the formal analysis tools, etc. Yes. Now, if I'm a developer that's writing in Solidity, mm -hmm. I need to specify uh, what version of Solidity I'm using, and I'll get the semantic, the case semantics of Solidity. And when I write a program, I can use the formal verification tools that come out of K to prove things about my program. Yes. And now as a developer, whenever like Solidity upgrades, I can also sort of upgrade to the new version of Solidity and have the proofs of my software in... You have the compiler and everything, all the tools for the new version, yes. So the way I envision this is um, uh, K to be like a universal language for the blockchain, right? In which you define your languages, be that Solidity, various versions of Solidity, be that Viper, Plutus, um, whatever language you want to write smart contracts in, high level language, let's say, and even the lower level languages. Well, to lower level, level, lower level languages, there is another story which I'll talk about later, but now let's talk about high level languages. All right, so now I would like to have the semantics of languages themselves be somewhere in the blockchain, okay? Because I, I want that to be fixed. Nobody can touch a semantics. Once I have, it has a unique ID, version number 3.2.7, and it's fixed. I don't want that to be, to be touched, right? So then you can refer to it on the blockchain, and then you can generate all the tools from it, and then you can have your smart contract verified. And I want to go one step further, not only verify the smart contract, but to have an actual proof of correctness of the smart contract. And that proof itself, or a hash of it, right, to be also stored on the blockchain. So it's not only that I have my smart contract on the blockchain, but I also have a proof why that smart contract is correct. And that proof is checkable by you or any third party in a way that you don't have to trust the K framework. Because the K framework, like any other frameworks, can, can have bugs itself. Coq uh, had bugs, right? People prove false with Coq, right? Um, so, um, so, so bugs are unavoidable, but what, but what we'd like to do is to use these tools, these program verifiers like, uh, like, 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 like the key framework, for example, to, to, to search for a proof. Once you have the proof, you should be able to generate a proof object that is completely checkable, independently of K. And I want to attach that proof object to my smart contract. And this way, you can imagine having smart contract on the blockchain together with certificates, correct certificates. Hey, my... My, my smart contract is correct. This is, this is the proof. So don't even 
think about attacking it <laughs> because it's been proved correct. And this is the proof. So if you believe that this is the specification, let's say let's take an ERC20 contract, right? You have an ERC a specification for ERC20 that is public. Everybody agrees that yes, that is the formal specification of ERC20. And now you prove that a smart contract implements an ERC20. End of story. It's correct. I have a proof that is checkable. I don't care how that proof was generated, whether with K or something else. I don't care. There is a fixed semantics of the language. Um, there is a fixed uh, proof, and those can be checked. And you can even imagine checking these proofs as a service on the blockchain, and uh, and uh, and you don't even uh, you know have to worry about um, as a user of a smart contract about K or anything like that. You you already have like you know okay that is is green. The contract is green. It's been proved. Correct. But of course, in order for this to, to happen, I mean, there is a lot work, of work to be done, you know, to generate proof objects. We don't generate proof objects yet. Um, also, the com compilers, we are still working on compilers from the semantics. We call this semantics-based compilation. That's not yet there. Um, still some research to be done uh, to improve performance. So is this what this uh, ERC20K project is? Because like, so the ERC20 is just like an interface, right? It's just, yes. it's basically just syntax. It's saying this is what a function should look like. And then, so this ERC20K project was adding semantics. Like not only is this in the syntax, but this is how, what it should do. This is what a send, a transfer function looks like or does. So we were, we were asked, we, we've been asked to verify some ERC20 tokens using our semantics of the Ethereum virtual machine. And uh, we verified some properties, but we didn't know exactly what, what does it mean for something to be RC20 compliant, right? So yes, we looked over this syntax, over this API, and uh, there were lots of words describing what the API is supposed to do, but that's not rigorous enough um, in order to get proofs done. So then in ERC20K, we formalized the ERC20 intended protocol completely to the last detail, all the cases considered, there were 13 different rules <laughs> semantic rules that were hidden in all the text in the RC20 uh, informal description. And uh, now we have a specification. We know what ERC20 is uh, from you know, a mathematical point of view. And now if somebody gives me a token, an implementation, let's say uh, the EVM level and claims it's an ERC20, I can now take it and automatically check it against the RC20K specification. And if it has any flaws, then those will be found and reported. Given that uh, you know many of our listeners are probably familiar with like ERC twenty, you know, could you maybe share were there any like hidden things you noticed in the ERC twenty, like any any gotchas that may have like not been noticed unless we went through this formal specification? Yes, so so people typically don't think of transferring from you to yourself, or when you call transfer from, so you you can transfer from A to B and you can be the caller C. Sometimes A, B, and C can be the same entity, right? So what if, what if you transfer from yourself to yourself uh, and you give yourself the allowance to transfer, right? So sometimes it's interesting that the order of operations matters, right? Whether you first de deduct the value from the, uh, from the account from which you transfer and then you add the value, you know, to the two account versus if you add the two first and then you deduct the value from the from account. So these are completely orthogonal operations, provided that the two accounts are different from and to. But if they are the same account, the order matters because one of them will run you into an over, overflow, the other one will not. So you may prevent an overflow by doing these operations in the right order. And, uh, and uh, actually, depending on which order you do these operations, you can have two different specifications of DRC20 and you have to comply with one or the other. Uh, which is a bit, um, I know, inconvenient, but um, but yeah. So this was the the, the totally unexpected uh, uh, behavior uh, that when you transfer from yourself to yourself, and we found lots of implementations where people sometimes prefer to add the value first and then deduct it, um, and others who first deduct the value from the from the balance of the from account and then they uh, they add it to the other one. And, and, and now you can have one case because that's where typically, you know, errors are in corner cases. You have this corner case when you transfer from yourself to yourself. And if you don't implement things properly, you may even be in a situation where you generate new tokens. <laughs> um, you know, this way. By transferring from yourself to yourself, you generate new tokens, which uh, you know, is crazy. 
I think like we we are we are running out of time, but like one of the last topics we would like to cover is uh, your partnership with uh, IOHK. You work for the Cardano project, so there you have created something which is called the KEVM, right? So walk us through what KEVM is and how it will be used in Cardano. So KEVM is a is a formal semantics of the EVM, uh, the same like the ERC twenty K, right? So we formalize the entire um, Ethereum virtual machine in the K framework, and that gives us an interpreter, basically an implementation of the virtual machine. And that is fast enough. It's only like an order of magnitude slower than the C++ reference implementation. And, uh, and uh, IOHK actually deployed this virtual machine generated completely automatically from the formal specification on a testnet um, a couple of weeks ago. And, uh, and the plan is to do the same with Yele, which is uh, an even, you know, the next generation of, uh, of a virtual machine for, for the blockchain that we designed together with IOHK. Um, and um, yeah, so, so first of all, so it's a formal semantics of a low-level machine and you can use it to execute smart contracts the same way you use the EVM implementation in C++, right, to, to run a smart contract on the blockchain. However, you can also use it to verify smart contracts, to prove smart contract work, which is exactly what we use to verify all this ERC20 compliance um, um, that, that I was talking about. All right, so that's what uh, KVM is, and and uh, and uh, and it is very tempting to deploy on a testnet such such uh, such uh, such a virtual machine because I mean it is essentially correct by construction. There is nothing to prove about it, right? So you mentioned before, Sunny, that uh, that um, you know you have these complex implementations, and how do you know whether they are correct, uh, if they are large, and so on. So the actual EVM is large. It's, that, that's a large piece of software, right? But if you generate it completely automatically from the formal specification in a way that is, makes it correct by construction, now you have you know, high confidence that, that you will not have bugs in, in, in that part of the, of the system. But, uh, so you did mention that it's like almost like an order of magnitude slower than the uh, C++ reference implementation. So would it be possible instead of, and like, instead of using it as the base client, like the client that everyone uses to so have a test net that, or a network that's entirely KEVM, what if it was used more as the reference client or like what I call it, like I think uh, Phil Dian, I'm sure you're from, you it know. Definitely can, it definitely can be I, used. And actually, yeah. if you go to jellopaper.org, we yeah. have, we, we deployed actually, we have a paper meant to replace uh -huh. the yellow paper, right, which, which has... Which, which is a reference implementation of the EVM, basically. You have a uh -huh. reference implementation from the semantics. However, however, we are working on a project now, also with, uh, with IOHK, where we want to generate a faster backend for K, an LLVM backend. So we are going to translate automatically the semantics into LLVM. And we expect that to be an order of magnitude faster. I see. And once that happens, we'll be able to actually generate you know, comparable in performance, virtual machine implementations from formal semantics. And then, then you may wonder, why should I even bother implementing a virtual machine if I can generate it automatically from the formal specification, correct by construction, and it has comparable performance? Why, why should I implement? Why should I take the risk to, to introduce bugs if, uh, if I don't have to? Essentially, Professor, is it correct to think like, so today you see a lot of different projects in this space where these projects set out to implement their own virtual machine and a language that compiles down to their virtual machine. And then this language uh, helps in formal verification in a particular way. Yeah. And so this is, this is the story behind Tezos. This is the story behind Scylla, which was the last uh, project we did. Uh, this is there's another called Zen Cash or something like that, some Zen project that's also doing something similar. And essentially, this K approach with Cardano could be like one approach that like overshadows and solves the problems that these uh, projects are trying to trying to solve. So essentially, in the K approach, what would happen? I don't know if it solves all the problems, <laughs> but it solves one problem, which is that. You can write your smart contract in any programming language for which you have a formal semantics. Exactly. So, 
once this is running on Cardano, so let's say uh, the uh, the programming language of um, Tezos Mikkelsen was was interesting. Developers wanted to use it. Somebody could just express the formal semantics of Mikkelsen in K. Yes. And then and then developers can write a smart contract in Mikkelsen and execute it in KV, a, EVM. K V A E V M or Yale or Yale. Uh, oh, so, yeah, yeah. But, but in order for that to happen, we have to still finalize this project uh, that we're working together with IOHK uh, on, which is called semantics based compilation, which is the following. You give me a language semantics and I give you a compiler for that language. And the compiler is basically a translator from your language to a low level language, which we plan to be Yele. Okay. So Yele will be this new virtual machine. It's an EVM like um, virtual machine, low level language. It's actually a combination of EVM and LLVM. You may have heard of LLVM. So it's an LLVM for the blockchain, right? We designed this language together with IOHK. And, and, uh, and what we want to do is to take any language which you have a case semantics and automatically generate a compiler for that language to YELL. All right, so if, if you suppose that you have, you like JavaScript, suppose, right? You write a, you write a smart contract using JavaScript. And as soon as, as far as you have a semantics for JavaScript in K, you can push the button and translate automatically, correct by construction, your JavaScript smart contract into Yele and then run it on the automatically generated <laughs> Yele VM. So everything is correct, the entire stack, right? The entire pipeline is correct. There is nothing, no code that needs to be verified by hand anymore because the entire thing is either generated automatically from the semantics or is formal semantics. <laughs> so you, with the uh, Yele, um, I, I noticed you guys also have a K WebAssembly uh, uh, system as well. And so what were some of the reasoning behind the building of Yele? Because I know WebAssembly is also very uh, similar and closely tied to LLVM. Yeah. Um, so what were some of the benefits, uh, like thought process of building Yele uh, when you were looking at like web, existing WebAssembly and EVM and stuff? So you may know that LLVM, LLVM has been created at the uh, University of Illinois. A professor in my department, Vikram Adve, was behind, uh, behind uh, LLVM. So we have a lot of uh, legacy here at UIC with LLVM and we love LLVM. And, uh, and uh, particularly one thing that we like about LLVM is all this uh, optimization, the LLVM optimi optimization pipeline, right? We'll take an LLVM program to another LLVM program, which is better, right? From some points of view uh, or by some metrics. And then you take that to another LLVM program. And to another, and so you keep transforming the program until you get the final program that you are happy with and then you translate to native code. So we really like this approach um, because in particular, you can imagine that you can take any high-level programming language, translate it quickly to, L to Yele, let's say, right? Because Yele is like LLVM. Yele is LLVM for the blockchain. Think of it that way. Right? Translate from that high-level language, let's say JavaScript, to Yele. And then you go from Yele to Yele to Yele to improve the gas metric, let's say, or to improve the size of the code, or, you know, you have some, some, some things to improve. And we can use many of the ideas that have already been developed by the LLVM community. And that's what we like to build up on. We like to build up on all this legacy um, and, and all the tooling uh, that has been developed around the LLVM project. Well, if we did the same for WebAssembly, then we would have to reinvent probably many of the of the of, of these techniques for, for WebAssembly. And why do it when we already know that this worked for LLVM? Um, and um, but we, yeah, so as you may know, actually we define the semantics in K of all these three, right? We define the KVM. We define the semantics of WebAssembly, and we are still defining it now. Uh, so one of our, one of my students, Everett uh, Hildenbrand, he's uh, actually also working for the Ethereum Foundation, and he's defining the WebAssembly in K as well. And then we have Yele that we defined for uh, for uh, for uh, um, IOHK with IOHK. So it's not like we favor one over the others. Actually, to be honest, I, I favor Yele over EVM <laughs> because uh, we really designed Yele in order. Uh, you know, with the explicit objective to avoid some of the problems that we learned while we uh, formalized the EVM. Right? But in between WebAssembly and Yale, I don't, I don't think there is any, any big, um, um, you know, differences uh, in terms of, uh, you know, one should be definitely better than the other or one is uh, better than the other. 
Um, and, and as a developer of the K framework, to be honest, I, I would like all the flowers to bloom. <laughs> uh, so, so the K framework allows all of this um, to live at the same time. And once you have semantics based compilation, you can just change the, the target uh, language and then you can go from any language to any VM, right? I can go from JavaScript to, to Yale or to JavaScript, from JavaScript to EVM or from JavaScript to Watson. All those should be possible because, because of the way the code is generated. <laughs> It's, it's not hard to change the backend of the, of the code generator. And that's for oh. execution, but then there is always the verification aspect, right? So having formal semantics for all of these, both for the languages and for the VMs, allows you to, to have no code left, which is not formally verified, which is my dream. That's what I'd like to see in the blockchain space. I'd like all the smart contracts to be formally verified. Sounds, sounds great, Professor. I mean, I, my, my sense is that the K framework is the general, the most general solution to all of these small specific problems that many of these blockchain projects are trying to solve by inventing their own languages and their own virtual machines and, and things like that. And I'm, I'm looking forward to what change K brings in the no, so, so please don't interpret me wrong. I'm not saying that these languages are not great. I think all of these languages and advances are great and they must be done. We have to come up with better languages for mass, smart contracts, with better virtual machines. But what I would like to encourage everybody to do is to have formal semantics for all of this. And then to have these generic tools that allow you to easily change the language or the VM and still have all the tooling around, as opposed to re-implementing reinventing the wheel over and over and over again, which is what we see a lot happening, at least in the academic community. Cool. Okay, so that brings us to the end of the show. Uh, to our listeners, thank you so much for joining us. We release new episodes of Epicenter Bitcoin every Monday or Tuesday. Thank you, Professor, for uh, being a guest on this podcast. We enjoyed the conversation a lot. Thank you, guys. Great questions. I'm very impressed. You really understand well the K-Framework. That means that we did our job well. <laughs> so you really, it's, it's amazing how, you, how, how deep your questions are and right to the point. Your videos and documentation were really good. Like I walked, walked through some of your tutorials and stuff. Those were very helpful. Excellent. Thank you, guys. So for our listeners, uh, if you're tuning in for the first time, uh, you can subscribe to the show on iTunes, SoundCloud, or your favorite podcast app for iOS and Android. You can also watch a video version of this particular show on YouTube at youtube.com slash epicenter Bitcoin. Recently, we have also started a Gitter community where you can chat with us, the hosts and other members of the epicenter community. The link is epicenter.tv slash gitter. We look forward to catch up with you there. Uh, we always welcome reviews of our show. It, it, it helps. It, it gives us feedback. It allows us to improve. It keeps us going. And it helps other people discover Epicenter. So please leave us a review on iTunes. And we look forward to catch you next week.